So good morning. Welcome to What is Mindfulness Anyway? I'm Beth Ran Estes, and I'm going to be introducing our speaker today. And I'm a member of the diversity committee at the iSchool at San Jose State University. Everyone's talking about it as a way to distress. So we're going to discuss today what is mindfulness anyway. Be more productive and improve mental health. It's now a billion dollar business that includes corporate trainings, apps, products, and online courses. But what actually is mindfulness anyway? This webinar will examine the recent popularity of mindfulness in Western society, as well as its history and tradition as a Buddhist spiritual practice. What parts of mindfulness have been embraced and adopted by our culture? And which portions have been ignored? What do its proponents rave about and what do its critics uh, argue? Is mindfulness a cultural movement or is it a fad? Is it a spiritual endeavor or an intellectual one? Is it political or apolitical, activist or apathetic? Is it an example of globalization or is it cultural appropriation? These are some of the questions that will arise during the exploration of this topic. You'll come away with a greater understanding of mindfulness be able to detangle the ongoing conversations surrounding it, and perhaps develop a curiosity to learn more. We encourage you to place questions into the chat. We will, however, not be addressing questions until the end of Jamie's presentation. So a little about our speaker today. Jamie Lynn is a librarian, educator, and designer living in Southern California. She's a 2014 graduate of the San Jose State University School of Information and has worked as a corporate researcher as well as an instructional designer in online higher education. It's my pleasure to introduce Jamie Lynn. Thank you, Beth, and um, hi, everybody. Um, just hearing the description of my um, talk for today, I was like, wow, that was really ambitious. <laughs> um, and you know, thankfully, I think I, I pretty much tried to stick to what I had described, but um, there is a lot that, that I will be covering today. And so first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Thank you for joining me. Um, this is a topic that I'm sure you hear a lot about. And maybe you have positive feelings about mindfulness. Maybe you're a skeptic. And maybe you're sick and tired of hearing about it and seeing it everywhere. Because we do see it everywhere. We see it on newsstands at the grocery store and in our online news and social media feeds. And there are so many books about mindfulness and not just books to read, but activity books, coloring books, puzzles, games, workbooks, books for kids, books for parents, books for teachers, books for all ailments. And there are apps, lots of them. This article is actually from three years ago, so that number is outdated. In fact, the first market research report on mindfulness came out in 2017, and it forecasted an annual growth rate of 11.4% for this industry. So in 2017, that was $1.21 billion, expected to be $2.08 billion by 2022. So I did a little bit of math, and I calculated that our current app market might look something more like this. And uh, I used to work in corporate research, which is all about data. So here's a little bit more data. Um, Google Trends data is a great way to track popularity of a topic. And so here we can see the searches for mindfulness have increased by a factor of four in the last 10 years. And all these slides do is illustrate the extent to which this topic captures our collective interest. Um, one last chart here, just because I think it's so delightfully librarian-ish. This is from a scholarly article published in 2017, and it uses LexisNexis data for news articles about mindfulness, which are shown in pink. So there's about 33,000 of them published in 2015. Scholarly articles shown in blue um, outpace these in growth, jumping from about 200 in 2005 to 1,100 in 2015. And that's really incredible. That is five and a half times growth. And as for the question of what are all these articles examining, uh, you know, I, I, that's unfortunately another talk for another day. Um, I did, the ones that I did look at do seem to cover all, pretty much everything that I talk about today and, and much more. So um, we won't be touching so much on the reasons why this is happening, though this is clearly, um, you know, showing our society's interest in both popular and scholarly perspectives. 
Um, what I do want you to consider as I'm talking today is this. What is the potential given all of its interest? How can it be used? How can it be abused, squandered, or nourished? The subject of mindfulness is gigantic and complex. And I really did try to narrow my topic, uh, but I do recognize that I am fitting in a lot today, probably more than I should have for one session. It's just really interesting. Uh, so we'll be looking at how mindfulness appears in our society in the United States. We're a capitalist society, and we have a history of valuing the strong individual who against all odds works really hard and succeeds in making a lot of money. But mindfulness comes from the Eastern spiritual tradition and is part of the Buddha's practice, or sorry, part of the Buddha's teachings to end suffering in ourselves and the world we exist within. When brought to a country that is highly suspicious of religion, specifically non-Christian religion, and values the individual over the larger community, how does something like mindfulness change? How does a culture that commodifies everything treat a philosophy that was meant to be offered to all people who expressed interest in it, regardless of their ability to pay? Is it still mindfulness? And what is mindfulness anyway? So I am not a cataloger, but for those of you who are interested in cataloging, you may want to consider these three current LC subject headings for mindfulness and think about where you might classify the information I'm sharing with you. Maybe it's time for a new subject heading, and if so, what would that be? Okay, so we will start in 2007 at a tech company called Google. An engineer named Chade Meng Tan came up with an idea. And I'm gonna let uh, Meng describe for you what his idea was. This is a video from 2012, and for some reason, when sometimes when I press play, it doesn't start to play correctly, the link comes around, so I, I may need to just, I mean. Like mining. Yep, here we go. Is the question of why did I do this? Right? How did Search Inside Yourself begin? Embarrassingly enough, it began with world peace. Search Inside Yourself started because I wanted to create the conditions of world peace in my lifetime. And the way it started was, uh, we have this thing called 20% Time Project. Like for those of you watching on TV, uh, engineers, at least in my days, when I, when I was a young man, <laughs> we could spend 20% of our time working on whatever project we wanted. And I figured, since I can do whatever I wanted, I might as well solve the toughest problem I know, which is world peace. Right? I mean, like, mining asteroids, like, anybody can do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> World peace, that is tough. Right? So I started thinking to myself, like the first question I asked, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for world peace? I figured something out. I figured that the two conditions which are necessary, each one insufficient, but combined may be sufficient. The first is the end of global poverty. The second is inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion on a global scale. And combined, I think they are necessary and sufficient. And then I figured since Gates and the, other, the rich guys are working on the first one, the second one, nobody's working on it, I'll work on it. How do I do that? And then after a few months, I figured it out. I figured out that the way to create inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion worldwide is to align it with the success of individuals and businesses, right? If we, can, if we can create those qualities in ways that help people succeed at work, that help business bottom lines, it's going to spread. Right? If it's just about goodness, and then, eh, it's kind of nice, then I go, go hug a tree, right? <laughs> but if it's like this thing, this thing, it will help you get your next three promotions and you will earn the company a lot of money. Or, oh, by the way, you will create world peace. Okay, so where do I sign up? Right? So, so the idea, uh, there, there's, a, there's a word for it. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking up right now. Upaya. Skillful means. Which means that to do something good, right? Do what, align with the people's self-interest in the way that the goodness is a necessary and unavoidable side effect. So help people succeed in a way where world peace is the unavoidable side effect. That's what I'm trying to do. Good. How do I do that? And then, 
couple of months of thinking, I figured that out. I figured out the way to do that is to create a curriculum for emotional intelligence for adults. And that was how SIY started. That was the story. So SIY, Search Inside Yourself, started or began with the story of one funny little engineer uh, and his pursuit for world peace. <laughs> and I hope that this story uh, will have a funny and happy ending. Okay, so I'll pause there. This is actually the ending part of a one hour long video. And it's actually quite enjoyable and informative. Uh, Michelle's just put the link in the chat if in case you had some issues watching it or you want to watch it again later. Um, so Ming is a really charming guy. He and he uses analogies like horseback riding and lifting weights to describe mindfulness. And Meng believes that mindfulness takes only 100 minutes of practice to have an effect and is trainable to a meaningful degree in seven weeks. Now the institute that he created to teach this, help employees get promoted while also creating world peace, is called Search Inside Yourself. And it has now become its own entity separate from Google. And its mission statement is we help people develop the leadership and emotional intelligence skills needed to intensify focus, manage stress, harness creativity, and improve resilience. And this is what corporate mindfulness is about, managing stress, improving worker productivity, and learning how to recover quickly from any number of workplace-related issues. How do they teach this? If you go to their website, um, you'll see that the, why is this not, oh, here we go. Um, that they offer trainings for organizations and for individuals. And let's just start by taking a look at an individual training. Um, right away, we can see that they're offered all over the world. I'm gonna choose one in the US, so we'll take Chicago. And you'll see it is a two-day course, nine to five. Join the emerging movement of companies integrating evidence-based mindfulness in their workplaces, emotional intelligence, neuroscience, and mindfulness. And so it's a two-day program followed by a four-week online journey. So it's a little less than the seven weeks that he was saying is, you know, is what is needed for training to a meaningful degree. Um, but I'm sure you'll learn the basics um, in this. Um, this coaching Education credits uh, is actually new since I added this to my presentation, but it's very interesting because it will um, relate to what I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit too. And here are your facilitators, these very friendly looking people. And here we go. Okay, so one ticket is $1,250 and plus a $45.69 fee. Um, I don't know about you, but that's, that seems really expensive to me. I, I can't, or, you know, I guess, no, no, I don't know if I would spend that much on a two day training. Um, but you know, they did say that they offered organizational training. So maybe you know, having them come talk to the organization would be, would be better. Um, now, they don't actually list their corporate prices on the main website, but I did find these figures on another page. And I just want to say, I wish I made $30,000 for two days of work. Uh, so two-day program, thirty-three. Or sorry, $30,000. A one-day program, $20,000. A half-day program, $10,000. And if you want a keynote, anywhere up to $7,500. So thinking about this a little bit, I wonder, well, how would someone like me, for example, go about becoming an SIY trainer? Teacher training. Okay, so... We're looking for candidates with established sales and marketing skills and or an existing network of clients to whom SIY can be offered. Uh, by the way, this emphasis on the, the, the text is there. It's a screenshot from their website. So once certified, the institution offers some support for business development. However, the expectation is that teachers would build their own business and client base. So to be a mindfulness teacher through SIY, I basically need to be a good salesperson um, that's probably not me, uh, but we're, we're investigating now, so let's just keep continuing. Okay, so the cost of the teacher training is going to be $9,800. Uh, and if you jump to the end of this text too, it says it does not include the cost of attending a two-day program, so I will have to pony up that $1,250 anyway. This is clearly an investment. I guess if you're um, thinking about it 
from the lines of I'll make $30,000 per training, maybe it's something worth it. But then there is this 25% licensing fee that's taken from my proceeds. Uh, and also it turns out that teachers need to sign a non-compete agreement as well. So any existing companies that work with SIY or any other SIY trainers are off limits. And that's why I would need to bring my own client base. Okay, so some people might do well in this model and many will not. How much money does SIY make anyway? For those of you who are interested in a career in research, please make note of this. Uh, financial information for nonprofits can be found through IRS Form 990. It won't have the most recent figures, but these can often be estimated. SIY is a registered nonprofit. In 2015, its assets totaled a little under half a million dollars, and you can see that it grew quite a bit over the next two years. If we calculate the year-on-year -year growth rate, and there are online calculators that do this for you now, so you don't need to do fractions on paper, uh, we find an absolutely astounding growth rate of 41.5% and 46.5%. Wow. So taking this a little further, just to show you, if you were doing this for your, you know, for your work, um, you can estimate 2018 and 2019 assets, uh, just using a figure within this range. So I used 40% to 50% growth to come up with um, 2019 numbers of 1.9 to 2.2 million. Now these are not giant numbers from a business perspective. It's really about that growth, the over 40% annual growth and starting from, you know, less than half a million dollars four years ago. And if you were in business, these would be extremely attractive figures to anyone looking to start a business. Oh, maybe it should be a mindfulness-based business. Maybe I can grow 40% every year. So SIY, a project originally created to help Google employees obtain promotions with the side effect of world peace, has another side effect, becoming a profitable business model. Meng said it himself, it's not about kindness, otherwise go hug a tree, this is business. So remember this slide, it's quite a bit more conservative than that 40% growth, but still significant. Um, to give you some comparison, the organic food market industry grew by about 6%, advertising by 9.6%, and the entire education sector by 7.9%. Um, so it's not Buddha statues, coloring books, and meditation cushions that are raking in the big bucks here. It's business models like this one. Now, I'm personally not going to pay 10 grand for an SIY certification and then pay them 25% of my earnings. Uh, we live in a world of options. And in this case, there are 103 million of them, which is the number of my results when I Googled mindfulness training. So I picked a site from its ads, of course. And here's what I got. Okay, and I have no pro idea if this program is good, if it's bad, mediocre, amazing, it was really chosen pretty much at random. But let's think about how we evaluate websites. Um, what would this course need in order for us to consider it to be credible and having authority? I'll just lie down a little bit. Okay, great, certificate, yes. We definitely want some sort of proof that we have completed this training. Um, some great some information about what we're getting a review. The curriculum looks quite intense. There are 30 sessions. Um, okay, here's our instructor. And aha, accreditation and certification. This is probably a good idea to have a certificate vetted and validated by somebody. Um, oh, certificate again, just in case you missed it. Okay, here's our accreditor and $540. Now, maybe just because we were comparing it to SIY, but this looks much more reasonable to me. <clears throat> Let's scroll back a little bit to that accreditation information because we are librarians and we're going to follow this trail. So International Mindfulness and Meditation Alliance, IMA. Let's type in IMA. And I've been here before, so it's already on my history. Okay, so here's some information about Emma. It's telling you why it was set up. And here's the advisory board. So we've got this guy, a corporate trainer and nature connection guide. We've got a life coach, CEO of Heart Life Academy. Change coach, facilitator, speaker, mental health advocate. 
and an author. Okay, so here's our the advisory board and you know, this is super quick and dirty evaluation. I'm just going to click on accredited schools now. And the first thing I see is Heart Life Coaching. And I do remember that that was uh, the name of one of the advisory board members uh, programs. Uh, a couple more in Australia. She's in Australia for children. The next one is the Nature Mindfulness, also um, a program by one of the advisory board members. Um, and then you'll see, and then the one that we had looked at. Um, so, you know, really, I guess you'd have to ask, what does it take to start an accrediting body in this business of mindfulness? And very little, apparently. A willingness, a website, really is the Wild West right now. But what we see is that um, the business of mindfulness not only includes large and small companies that provide corporate mindfulness training, it also includes the education process to become the trainer certified online courses, the institutions that accredit them, membership fees, accreditation fees, certification fees, all another side of the business. And once you have your certification, you can start your own business or join a company that hires uh, HERT certified teachers like the DEN in Los Angeles. The DEN has a glossy website and brochures and offers a variety of mindfulness services so we'll see here classes, workshops, private meditations, private healings, corporate kids retreats, online podcast. And their model is that of the yoga studio with drop-in courses. So here's today's schedule. Mindfulness at 10 and a bunch of other things as well. Um, so on their corporate brochure, they mentioned that their teachers meet the highest standard for training and education. What does that mean? And does it mean anything, given what we've just seen? Oops, we're going back to that. Let's continue on. Okay, and so for businesses that want to take a different approach, perhaps more cost-effective approach, um, there are software platforms like this one, which is called eMindful. And this shows um, in the data and the numbers that businesses understand why mindfulness is something that companies should embrace. And for the budget-minded organization, there is the do-it-yourself kit, everything you need to teach a one-day workshop for improving mindfulness, including the instructor guide and the training manuals, no certification necessary. Okay, so how did we get here? Uh, that was a very quick look at the business of mindfulness, the burgeoning industry of mindfulness as it appears in the US from a root in Buddhist philosophy and teachings. So our next section now is a very brief and very incomplete history of mindfulness in the United States. This is easily another hour long talk in itself. Um, so I've determined three distinct types of mindfulness, Buddhist, MBSR, and MBCT, which I'll get to in a bit. And of course, the new corporate mindfulness that we just learned a little bit about. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, and this, is, this itself is very misleading because there are many Buddhist traditions and lineages, it may help to think uh, about the variety of Christian denominations and then you start to get the picture. But in, in the U.S. Buddhist tradition, one of the most recognizable figures in the West is Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Vietnamese monk and the founder of the Plum Village tradition, which I've read is the largest Buddhist organization in the West. He came to the United States in the mid-1960s as academic faculty at Princeton and then Columbia. And he is a well-known author. He's published over a hundred books. And these books are generally very easy to read in short chapters and paragraphs. And he's credited with making mindfulness really accessible to the average Westerner by not focusing on Buddhist texts, but speaking of the practice of being mindful, of taking it off the meditation cushion to do mindful eating, walking, talking, even mindful fighting. Some call him the father of mindfulness. Um, he's also a peace activist and poet. He was exiled from Vietnam for four years because of his anti-war activities. And Martin Luther King Jr. nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1967. S.N. Goinka was a wealthy Burmese businessman from the country we now know as Myanmar. He started meditating because of debilitating headaches and it completely changed his life. 
He brought Vipassana meditation, a style of sitting meditation that centers around mindfulness of breath and of body, to India in the 1970s, and he started his first U.S. center in 1982. There are now hundreds of his retreat centers and locations in the world. 20 of them are in the U.S., and three of them are in California. And what's really interesting about Goenka's model is that his teach, uh, he's, they've always been offered completely free of charge in keeping with the Buddha's intent that his teachings be offered to all those interested, regardless of their ability to pay. So if you've heard of meditation boot camps, it probably refers to a Goenka center. These are very traditional retreats. There's chanting in Pali, the original language of the Buddha, and they're intended to teach the experience of mindfulness through 10 days of silent sitting meditation. Now, because he spoke English, Goenka attracted a number of Western students, including Ram Das, Baba Ram Das, Daniel Goldman, the guy credited with emotional intelligence, and Sharon Salzberg. Sharon Salzberg, along with Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein, established the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts in 1975, based on Vipassana teachings. And a few years later, Jack Kornfield established Insight Meditation West, which is now called Spirit Rock in the Bay Area. These centers are the best known secular Buddhist meditation centers in the US, and they offer retreats that can be quite expensive, costing several thousands of dollars. The words of Vipassana and insight meditation are now used interchangeably, though I'm going to say that insight embraces the idea of secular Buddhism, while Goenka refers to his style of Vipassana as non-sectarian. And I had to look up the differences in those words, so I'll share them with you. Uh, secular means not religious, and non-sectarian means not related to a specific religious group. So yes, religious -y sort of, but even if you're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, you can still practice Vipassana without being Buddhist. So in addition to embracing a secular view of Buddhism, the history and culture of insight meditation has been predominantly white, liberal, college educated, and middle and upper middle class. Recently, there has been significant movement to diversify um, with scholarships offered to people of color and now retreats specifically for people of color. Uh, you know, but it is maybe a little ironic that Western Buddhist meditation in the U.S. has been historically white and wealthy and is now trying to include people of color. Mindfulness became a part of the U.S. scientific community through the work of John Kabat-Zinn. He studied with Thich Nhat Hanh and the Insight Meditation Society, and he found the teachings to be very valuable but he was concerned about the religious side of it. So as a scientist, he knew his intended scientific audience wouldn't accept a foreign and religious practice as the basis of medical treatment. So he completely removed Buddhist elements and took only the small section that included mindfulness. The result of this was an eight week clinical program for pain management called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. So you can say, you know, Kabat-Zinn really understood his intended user his intended user group and how to gain traction and success within that community. And he designed something specifically for them. MBSR has been the foundation for mindfulness in the neuroscience, psychology, and counseling communities with offshoots such as mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, and mindful self-compassion. And these are considered well-established and respected programs for mental health care. There have been many scientific studies now that prove uh, using tools like fMRIs, how meditation affects our brains. Uh, the benefits have been validated through scientific study, and we saw that a little bit earlier with that, you know, amazing chart. So John Kabat-Zinn, by the way, he is the son-in-law of Howard Zinn. I found that really interesting, and I thought you might too. Uh, he's been called the founder of modern mindfulness. He legitimized the practice of mindfulness through the scientific medical community, which allowed our Western secular society to embrace an Eastern spiritual practice without the Eastern spiritual practice. So here's a depiction of the Eightfold Noble Path, the path that the Buddha outlined we must follow in our daily lives to end suffering within ourselves, to develop a heart of generosity, of compassion towards others, and to eventually, at some point in our multiple lives, achieve enlightenment. You'll see that right mindfulness is just one spoke of the eight spoke wheel. And the word right in front of mindfulness refers to a set of moral and ethical guidelines like don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, similar to the Ten Commandments in Christianity. 
Now, in addition to the Eightfold Noble, Eightfold Noble Path, there are four foundations of mindfulness um, in Theravada Buddhist teachings. I'm not going to get into that today, but also mindfulness is the first of the seven factors of awakening. So you see here that right mindfulness goes together with investigation, energy, and joy. Some of these lead to each other, in fact, like um, mindfulness leads to investigation, leads to energy, leads to joy. Some of them arise concurrently. Um, so tranquility, concentration, which is really clear awareness, and equanimity, um, which is defined as mental calmness, composure, and evenness of temper especially in a difficult situation. Now this mental calmness and composure is how today's mindfulness is marketed to you and me, right? Don't stress, be calm, be mindful. And yet here we see it's just one thing and that calmness is actually considered something else in here. So you can ask what is mindfulness without the rest of the spectrum and how are we supposed to get to anonymity if we only have one? So Kabat-Zinn took mindfulness without the right from this larger structure, and he created MBSR, an, an entire system of thinking about mindfulness, which has become the widely accepted and understood definition of mindfulness in the West. And speaking of definitions, uh, part of the challenge of understanding mindfulness are the variety of definitions for it. So let's compare one of Thich Nhat Hanh's descriptions with John Kabat-Zinn's. But Thich Nhat Hanh says, mindfulness is the continuous practice of deeply touching every moment of daily life. To be mindful is to be truly present with your body and your mind, to bring harmony to your intentions and actions, and to be in harmony with those around you. Uh, Kabat-Zinn says, mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. So the first definition includes something outside of yourself, the harmony of intention and action to yourself as well as those around you. And mindfulness is described as a continual practice. Second definition defines mindfulness as something that is within oneself, an awareness that emerges, and it's of the present moment. And if you'll recall that Meng Tan's company is called Search Inside Yourself. So this second definition is what is often used to describe mindfulness in the United States. Uh, for a country that thinks in terms of the individual and the self, mindfulness then becomes something centered and existing within the individual. Also note that mindfulness itself is an English word. It's a translation of a Pali word, sati, which is very loosely defined as remembrance and awareness. And in the Buddhist context, something that is developed through certain actions such as meditation. And meditation, a word that's often paired with mindfulness, is not necessarily mindfulness. There are forms of meditation that are not related to mindfulness, and while mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition is a form of meditation in the United States, it's not necessarily considered meditation, but uh, concentration and focus. So here's where I say, will the real mindfulness please stand up? Because this is a central part of the confusion surrounding the term and what it means. Um, etymologists, please you know, chime in here. If you translate an idea with an English word, does that English translation become its own thing, separate from its original and historical root? And, you know, too, what I'm sharing with you today is very, a very cerebral look into the meaning of mindfulness. I want to emphasize that the Buddhist understanding of mindfulness is not through our conceptual thinking brains, which we're using now, um, but through our experiential bodies. So, for example, you can read as many books about learning how to play the piano as you want, but you'll gain a much better understanding of how to play the piano by actually sitting down at one and playing it and practicing it repeatedly over years. The one practices mindfulness through a certain way of paying attention to what is happening within and around you. Let's return briefly to MBSR. Uh, it has its own certification and training process and schools and accreditors and historical precursor to corporate mindfulness. Of course, MBSR practitioners fall within a spectrum. Some study MBSR and then continue to explore and practice mindfulness within their lives and, and explore further. And then, of course, you know, there are those who will get the certificate so that they can do their job and offer a certain kind of mental health care to their clients. 
think it's probably an oversimplification to blame or credit, depending on how you see it. Um, Kabat-Zinn with corporate mindfulness. We live in a society based on free market enterprise that esteems science and that thinks in terms of the individual instead of the community. And you know, maybe that also has something to do with our social ailments that we suffer from stress, depression, and anxiety. This Boston Consulting Group article describes mindfulness as a centuries old idea reinvented to address the challenges of our digital age. Mindfulness is perfectly suited to counterbalance the digital age challenges of information overload and constant distraction. And here are a couple more examples of the need for and the benefit of corporate mindfulness. On the left, a section from the DENS corporate brochure. Today's employees are overscheduled, burnt out, and report feeling little bandwidth for innovation and big picture thinking. Effective teamwork is about more than finishing a task list. Your employees need clear focus, flexibility, and purpose in the face of change. On the right, we have an example of how corporate mindfulness makes Aetna employees more productive, saving the company $3,000 per employee per year. Okay, so now we come to the backlash, the criticism. Oh man, that was, that was my reveal. Okay, pretend you didn't see that. So the term MIC mindfulness um, was coined in 2011 by a psychotherapist named Dr. Miles Neal, who practices Tibetan Buddhism. The name refers to the surface level treatment of mindfulness in our culture not just corporate culture, but also in the MBSR counseling world. So he, uh, according, according to Dr. Neil, so he has similar concerns about the way we understand and embrace yoga, and he calls it frozen yoga. So both of these practices, quote, provide immediate nutrition, but no long-term sustenance, end quote. And by this, he means a spiritual sustenance, one that will truly change you, open you, and connect you. And I find this yoga example especially compelling because yoga, as we know it, is more established in our society. So let's take a look at this for a minute. I'm going to assume that many of you have attended a yoga class at some point in your life, or you know people who go to yoga regularly. But do, do you know that the yoga poses, the asanas, are only one part of a larger spiritual tradition? We're taught the poses for flexibility, strength, and de-stressing, and we're largely unaware that there is anything else to it. So as we're talking about mindfulness uh, today, compare this with your experience with yoga. People love yoga. It makes you feel good. And people also love mindfulness. Uh, does it matter? Does it matter that there is more? And does it matter that that is not commonly understood or practiced by many yoga teachers themselves? So when you say namaste at the end of class, do you know what it means? I see it in a lot of memes, social media memes, usually followed by a swear word. Uh, and you know, it's usually used, uh, or sometimes used sarcastically and as a way to make fun of yogis. And it means the divine in me recognizes and acknowledges the divine in you. So what happens when we are disconnected or ignorant about the foundation of something like yoga or mindfulness? Something to think about. So Ron Purser is the guy who made the term Mick, Mick Mindfulness famous or infamous. He's a professor of management at San Francisco State University, also a Buddhist in the Korean tradition, and he's written academic as well as popular articles on the subject and a book that is called Mick Mindfulness, How Mindfulness Became the New Capitalist Spirituality. His question of um, purpose here is not about individual stress-reducing benefits, but an inquiry into social structures. And the way that Purser explains it, our personal stress has societal causes. And without addressing this, mindfulness is nothing more than basic concentration training, a tool of self-discipline disguised as self-help. Instead of setting practitioners free, as it is meant to do in its original form, to be free of suffering is the very goal of Buddha's teachings. It helps them adjust to the very conditions that caused their problems. So, for instance, social problems such as inequality, racism, poverty, addiction, they become viewed as individual issues. And work stressors like working long hours or working multiple jobs 
job insecurity and the threat of constant layoffs and subsequently losing your health insurance, a bad boss, lack of autonomy, all of these become an individual's responsibility to manage. After all, if the fMRI shows that stress physically appears and disappears in a person's brain, then it's something that the person created, right, and can therefore control. This kind of thinking about mindfulness, according to Purser, <clears throat> keeps you focused on yourself and how to improve yourself. And everyone else's problems are their responsibility to manage, and you never need to examine the social and structural causes of your suffering. This mindfulness tells you that you can fix yourself. You just have to fight, find the right podcast, the right app, the right workshop, and keep shopping if one of those doesn't work for you. And if nothing works for you, then that's your failure. That's not that of an unjust system. So Purser is just one man. He happens to write a lot, and he also writes very well. His articles are really interesting to read. But I did find in my research that he is either the author or the co-author of all the articles that I found online that address this type of criticism for mindfulness and that define it as a product of capitalist neoliberal greed. And uh, as you can imagine, practitioners of MBSR object to this lumping of themselves into his characterization. Uh, in this mindful response, the authors explain that no, con contemporary mindfulness is a marriage between secular Buddha, contemporary Buddhism and science, not capitalism. But they do, in this response, they do recognize there is a brand of mindfulness light that shows up in corporate trainings and they distance themselves from it saying that this is not what is taught in MBSR and MBCT. Now mindfulness is a way to observe and identify your emotions and how they appear and disappear in your body and teaches you to not self-identify with the emotional reaction. A lot of people, most of us, I would say, have never learned to do this, or we've never been encouraged to do this. So a corporate mindfulness workshop might be the only exposure that someone has to the idea that, to this idea, and that it's also okay and even maybe good to take some time to just sit and pause for a minute. Thich Nhat Hanh is someone who believes that real change can happen in businesses that practice mindfulness. Um, this belief is called the Trojan horse theory in, in academic work, um, and it's, you know, referring to sneaking in that disguised weapon that will bring down the fortress. So Meng Tan also believes in this side effect of world peace. While searching inside yourself, you will open to compassion for the suffering of others. In a way, they're just, you know, bringing mindfulness into the, the existing structure, capitalist structure of our society. So while there has been no evidence of this level of institutional change to date, um, this would definitely be something that takes time, right? And it would probably be part of something larger, like more mindful consumers demanding that the companies that they work for be more socially responsible. And also a shift in corporate culture, which is often generational, that wants physical and mental wellness to be a part of employee care. Living in a free world means that we have plenty of choices for how to become familiar with mindfulness. Multiple day sitting retreats are not for everyone. And even if you wanted to go, it might not be possible to find that kind of time. An app might be ideal for you right now. A book might be good for your friend. A drop in class might work best for your coworker. And yes, some of these options may provide a more limited view of mindfulness, but whatever works best for you might change you, might make you, make you happier. And you know, that's a good thing. What we want to avoid is the mental exhaustion and rebellion that arises from having it marketed to us everywhere. So I think this is what makes us start dismissing it, has us treating it like namaste, you know, with sarcasm, with derision, with rolled eyes. We don't control how and how often this is advertised to us, but we can learn to be mindful in our response to it. And to understand that it's not mindfulness that it's annoying, it's the way it's being shoved in our faces, marketed, whitewashed, and used to make us feel bad about ourselves. And in fact, I think that welcoming mind mindfulness as a practice into your life will actually help you not buy or buy into anything that is marketed to, intended to make you feel bad about yourself. It, maybe it will be even, maybe it could be the downfall of consumer culture. We can only hope, right? Um, so I meditate, I go to retreats, and I think mindfulness is great. It's changed my life. I used to be the kind of person, not too long ago, actually, who absolutely hated the word gratitude and saying things like, just be kind or breathe out love. 
So if you're a skeptic, I definitely get you. Um, I reveled in my bad attitude and in my emotional pain because I defined myself by that. And now I can say I am a very grateful and happy person. And by happy, I don't mean, you know, la, 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 everything is awesome. Uh, it's more a peace of mind and a sense of my place in the larger world. And it really is because of mindfulness, which led me to dive a little deeper into that whole Eightfold Noble Path to cultivate self-compassion, compassion for others, and a heart that wants to share, to be open and to breathe out love. Uh, Buddhists are very familiar with this sensation, and they refer to it as cultivating a heart of generosity. And this appears in many ways. So you, for in instance, you're being offered an example of it in the mini conference that's starting right after this webinar about wholehearted librarianship. This is very closely related to mindfulness, loving kindness, compassion, and how to bring this into your work. It's breathing out love, right? And remember how I mentioned that Buddhism in the US has been historically white and wealthy. Well, time changes, hearts open, and people really begin to truly examine themselves and their institutions closely and take concrete purposeful steps to change the status quo. And now there are quite a few teachers who are people of color, not trainers, but teachers in the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist path. And what happens when you have people of color, especially with those who have a background in MBSR or social work, community work, counseling, education, and who have years of experience studying and practicing mindfulness meditation. When people like this begin teaching the Dharma, the path, this is where it gets really radical. And this is where we witness the dream of a collective transformation of suffering into freedom. Mindfulness is neurodecolonization, according to social worker M Michael Yellowbird, a dean and professor at the University of Manitoba. You take that science-based concept of neuroplasticity and rewrite how you view yourself in the world and how you react to it. It's about self-empowerment through overcoming histories of trauma and using that empowerment to teach others to heal. The East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, California is composed of about 40 to 50% people of color and equal numbers who identify as part of the LGBTQI community. The Meditation Coalition in Los Angeles um, holds talks on subjects like undoing patriarchy and prison reform. And Liberate is a free app that offers recordings by teachers of color to the black identified community on subjects like handling microaggressions, racism, ancestors, self-worth, love, and compassion. These are examples of a growing movement of creating aware and engaged spiritual-based communities within our increasingly fractured society. And I'm not particularly surprised that this is being led by people who have historically found themselves written out of history and who have generations of collective pain and trauma to address and who choose as their heart-based work to heal their communities. We live in a country that gives us options. We get to choose how we see mindfulness, whether it's as a commodity, a tool for capitalists, a religious thing, a way to better understand yourself, or even as a movement to bring about great social change. So what appeals most to you about all of this? You get to choose. But uh, you know, what would it be like to break together rather than to break apart? Uh, finally, I'll close with a metta prayer, a loving kindness blessing. May you be peaceful. May you be happy. May you be safe and healthy. And may you grow through wisdom and love every day and with intention. Thank you. There's a little resources link at the end here. It's not really complete, but for those of you who want to learn a little bit more, you can visit the slides later. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, there are some questions that came in, so I do want to make sure we have 11 minutes, so you do have time for questions. Uh, anybody can place questions in the chat. Um, yes, thanks, Michelle. I also want to say, if your question is more of a personal nature, I'm not a mindfulness uh, trainer or teacher, but um, I'm happy to, I'm going to share my personal email in the chat, and if you wanted to email me, I'm happy to, you know, answer you one-on-one. -on -one. And while you're doing that, Jamie, I'm going to scroll up because we had a question that came up around 1124 from Norton. Um, and I can read it to you if you'd like. Yes, please. 
Okay, the question was, are you aware of any studies, research that explore how mindfulness is operating in libraries for librarians? Uh, like not just try it articles, but good hard looks. Um, the only one that I saw was um, not quite, because I did look, I did do a search for mindfulness in libraries and it was, um, Oh, see, now I can't even remember because it wasn't actually relevant to, to what I was researching. Um, I think that that is actually a fantastic research opportunity right there. Um, and especially because, you know, my libraries and especially public libraries are communities that um, that would be practicing this or welcoming it into their community spaces. Um, yeah, I think there's an excellent research opportunity there, but but no, I'm not aware of um, that particular aspect, but I also am not aware of the um, huge amount of academic articles that have been published recently um, on this topic. And I did a quick search just in Google Scholar, and it looks like there has been uh, some literature written, and there are several books. One, I see Amanda just typed in, uh, it's a more recent one, Recipes for Mindfulness in Your Library. Uh, and then there's one called The Mindful Librarian, Connecting the Practice of Mindfulness to Librarianship and a whole host of um, articles. It looks like a lot of them are come from the academic sector, but um, may wanna check into that. Um, let me see, I'm gonna scroll and see if, uh, Drea Douglas did share a great NPR article, uh, how Namaste flew away from us. So I uh, just wanna let you know about that. Yes, thank you. That one, uh, that one always makes my heart hurt a little bit every time I see it used really sarcastically. Um, here's another question. Um, it looks like a uh, Jill Jastako, I hope I said it correctly, um, will like to uh, learn how we can continue the conversation after this webinar. And um, Jill has provided some background um, as to, it sounds like her experience in working uh, in Colorado and would like to learn how others are using mindfulness in the library setting and collaborate with others to find ways to bring meaningful programs to staff and patrons. And so she says, thank you um, for starting the conversation. Uh, if there's any other questions, go ahead and place them in the chat. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of wonderful, thank you. Oh, here's a question. Um, it's from, I'm not sure who, it's from a number, but it, the question is, what was it that changed you from a bit of a skeptic to someone who believes in mindfulness? Uh, great question. And it was the practice of it. It was actually taking the time to sit down and try it. And um, I started with just reading some of Thich Nhat Hanh's smaller books um, and then trying to explore, you know, how I would, or, or finding those so helpful for me um, and then jumped right into a 10 day silent going to retreat, um, which I really enjoyed. Well, enjoyed is not the quite word, uh, uh, the quite, the correct word. It's not for everyone, for sure. But um, just being able to sit for 10 days with myself and actually experience what was happening was life changing. Great. Um, I will have to do that <laughs> more often, even. <laughs> even there are many that. options. There are two day <laughs> retreats, there are four day retreats. Um, you know, 10 days I, is good because you can't leave. I'm, it, you know, they kind of lock you in because it, it is you know, your mind is kind of wild, crazy place. And after a couple of days, you're like, okay, I got to get out of here. Um, so the 10 day really does make you say, no, you have to, sit. there's no option. You have to sit. Um, but there are definitely some, some easier, um, more gentle options to, to teach this. And are there any other questions? You can place them in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I do want to remind everyone of, uh, I already posted it in the chat, but right after this is the Wholehearted Library Soft Skills for 21st Century Information Professionals. It is from noon to 3 p.m. Pacific. It's a free online, will be recorded, a mini conference, um, really adding on even to this topic. So you can go to the link and register. And then secondly, I will mention our upcoming webinar. So on our website, and here's the link for this, are the upcoming webcasts um, on a variety of topics. And we have a host of uh, diversity series coming up, different topics. Um, the next one in April will be around uh, the topic of uh, library services to immigrants. 
a discussion on the role of information and migration. So we welcome you to attend those as well. Uh, the recording, there is a question. What will happen is the recording and the uh, presentation will be posted on our website, uh, generally within one to two weeks of the actual presentation. So look for it on our website on the on-demand webcast page um, within two weeks of um, this presentation. And here's that link if you would like to have it. So it'll be recorded, posted there with these slides. And then I see Josh had a comment. Thank you, great presentation. I love the criticism of capitalism and mindfulness. This piece is usually missing, but is essential. And then some more thank yous. Well, thank you all for attending, for taking the time out of your busy day. Um, and yeah, I do hope that you have the time to see what the um, Wholehearted Librarianship Mini Conference is about. That's, that sounds really interesting. Thank you again, Jamie. We really appreciate it. And thank you to Beth and Debbie for your support today and for all of you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at a future session. Thank you again, Jamie. Thanks. Bye, everyone.